All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 2, Section 4, New Worlds in the Americas, Labor, Commerce, and the Columbian Exchange. In terms of labor, what we're going to focus on here is the development from Encomienda, which was a Native American. labor system to the movement towards African slavery. And what you find in the new world is that whether it's Spain or other countries or whatever ends up occurring is that most of them end up relying upon African slavery. So for Spain, initially in their conquest, they had forced the indigenous populations to work in things like the silver mines. And the silver mines were what made Spain incredibly wealthy. Uh, An encomienda gives the Spanish landowner or the Spanish mine holder the authority to extract labor from the population that lives there. However, many of the uh, many of the Native Americans who were working in the silver mines died from disease, and in some cases, you could have a fatality rate of perhaps ninety percent. So on a pure practical level, simply to enslave the Native American population was not, um, it didn't work because too many were simply just dying of disease and exposure to disease. At the same time, the Spanish were also in the business of converting. And they did so by very harsh methods. The Spanish were very much a my way or highway type of uh, empire. And if you were an indigenous person and not practicing Catholicism in the way that Spain wanted you to, to do, uh, they would punish you. And there was very violent punishments that were required. So when we look at these two things together, kind of the harsh conversion techniques, the encomienda labor system, which more or less enslaved the Indian population, uh, this was kind of a very harsh approach to the new world. In fact, those that were critical of Spanish treatment of Native Americans. This illustration was created by somebody who was critical of it. Uh, there was a, a you know, reason to intervene. In fact, this was known as the Black Legend. So the Black Legend was how Spain treated the Native population. And especially in countries like England, this became, in some case, a justification to go to the New World, that since Spain was doing all these harsh things. However, there were some within Spain, like Bartolomeu de las Casas, who, for really lack of a better term, we'll call him a reformer. He was a Christian missionary himself, and he was appalled by the way that Spain had treated the native population. In fact, he himself had had an encomienda and had somewhat of a uh, realization that Spain needed to change its behavior and he constantly spoke out against the harsh treatment of the Indian population at the hands of the Spanish so much so that he was successful in getting the king of Spain to pass the new laws and the new laws outlawed enslaving the native population I outlawed that. And when we look at Spanish colonization, there's somewhat of a contradiction there, right? Is it is it conquest? Is Spain there to plunder and enslave in the way that Columbus and Cortez did? Or are they there to convert, right? To literally save people's souls? And could you do both, right? Could you do both? Well, de las Casas and the new laws are both evidence of Spain moving more towards this direction, right? To kind of get rid of that, uh, that conquered past. And so one of the reasons why the Spanish moved towards African slavery is in fact due to both of these reason, reasons. The passage of the new laws, which outlaws enslaving the Indian population, and the dramatic effect, and I'll go ahead and highlight, uh, highlight it up here because it's important, that disease had. African slaves, on the other hand, because they were from the old world, they had immunities, right, immunity. They were considered non-Christians by those in Spain. 
recall the contentious relationship between Christianity and Islam, especially in Western Africa. Western Africa was a place in which the ruling class were Muslims, and so it was more acceptable to enslave an African than it was a Native American because of those religious reason, reasons. The Portuguese, if you don't recall, I've mentioned this in some of the chapters previously, Portuguese factories, these were bases. Whoa, what happened there? Uh, these were bases in Africa in which the Portuguese and later the Dutch would trade with local African lords and chieftains for slaves. And many of those slaves would make their way to the New World to grow sugarcane, most likely in places like the West Indies. Now, even though we're focused mostly on Spain here, it's important to note that as far as sugar plantations go, the English, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, many other nations had sugar plantations. But when we look at labor systems and the way that labor changed in the case of Spain, it went from encomienda to permanent African slavery. Now, moving along to the world of commerce. Commerce refers to as trade. And like we said before, let's go ahead and get the green here. Whether you're Spain, England, France, whatever country, the Dutch, Portugal, they all have an incentive to make money. There are other incentives, but making money is a huge one. And a lot of the trade goods that come from the New World are highly sought after. The Spanish made their uh, money off of silver, discovering one of the largest silver mines in the world. At Potosi, something like 80% of all the world's silver came out of this mine. So the Spanish became incredibly rich from this silver mine right here. Uh, and other raw materials that were produced, this might include things like sugar, tobacco. We might also include, if we're talking about the French and the Dutch, we might also include things like fur. We might even include food like rice. All of these things were grown in the New World or harvested. Uh, and the important thing is that these are mostly all designed for export, right? For export. Now, behind all this, and let's go ahead and get our green color here for money, there's a very important economic theory at work here, mercantilism. And mercantilism is the economic theory by which all of these nations operate, right? Spain, France, England, the Dutch, et cetera, et cetera. And it helps us explain the relationship between these nations and how the economy of the new world forms. Mercantilism, and, and we see it down here again, seeing how it affects the colonies. Mercantilism as an economic theory believes that the world has a limited amount of wealth and that this wealth mostly is in the form of gold and silver. And so the whole goal of mercantilism is to have the most gold and have the most silver, right? That's the goal. You can think of it being like a pie chart. This is all the gold and silver in the world. And each country has their own slice of the pie. We'll call this France. We'll call this Spain, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea, and that's a very poorly drawn pie chart, but you get the point. The idea is that if one country becomes richer, right? So if Spain becomes richer, their slice of the pie gets bigger, right? Now they have this bigger slice of the pie. What does that mean for a different country? Well, it means that somebody else had to have got poor. In other words, mercantilism is zero sum, right? In order for one country to get rich, another country has to get poor. And so that means if you're trying to hoard all the gold and silver, it means that you don't trade with each other. You especially don't buy things from other, other countries. And so Spain, France, Portugal, and England, they don't trade with each other. If France wants to get their own silver, they have to go out there and get it. So it creates for an incredibly competitive um, 
economy in the new world, right? Incredibly competitive with these countries not willing to trade with one another. In terms of the relationship between the colonies and the mother country, uh, mercantilism is a theory that states that any sort of raw material, right, we'll think about some of these things right here, must only be traded with the mother country, right? If Spain produces silver, there's only one place where that silver is going. If France gets furs, there's only one place that that fur is going, and that is to the mother country. And so later on, we'll learn about various laws that are used to enforce this, right? Now, if you're a merchant, right, you're a, uh, let's say you're an English tobacco grower, you want to trade with whoever's going to give you the highest price. Sometimes that's going to be your mother country, but sometimes it won't be. And so the fact that you have many of these nations enforcing mercantilism, right, creating laws that force the colonies to only trade with their mother countries, this is going to cause some problems later on down the line and is one of the reasons why the American Revolution breaks out, right? English colonists who want to trade with other people. Uh, the effect that this has in the New World, all this together, is a commodification of natural resources and, in fact, finished goods. Commodification is essentially uh, buying and selling. So for example, this was even true for Native Americans who before European arrival to the New World would more or less produce to consume, uh, but rather were producing to, to sell and buy. So furs are a great example, right? The Huron and the Algonquian before the French arrived would only hunt as many furs as they were gonna use. Uh, once the French came and were willing to trade things like guns and alcohol and metal tools and other really sought after trade goods, the Huron and the Algonquian pretty much just hunt and, 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 and find and harvest these furs 24-7, um, right? Because the more that they can harvest, the more that they can sell, the more money they get and the more stuff that they have. So commodification is the buying and selling of these resources rather than consuming. And especially for European countries, mostly exports, right? These are all being exported to Europe and the old world. So that idea behind mercantilism and the way that the new world economy operates is important in understanding some of the events like the American Revolution, and we'll certainly come back to that point, but very competitive, right? Very competitive between these nations. Lastly, we want to talk about the Columbian Exchange. This is a very, very important event. This is the exchange of biology between New World oops, and Old World. Right. So we know what the Spanish did. We know what Cortez did. We know what some of those other individuals did. But what did the plants and animals do? Right. Actually, animals. We also want to talk about things like uh, germs, right? This also factors into it. And so recall that the new world and the old world were isolated for 10,000 years. So it wasn't just different human societies, but it was different plants on each side, different animals on each side. And when Columbus and those subsequent voyages occurred, all that biology clashed with one another in something referred to as the Columbian Exchange. And among these commodities were, very, there were some very important commodities among this exchange of plants and animals. Sugar, incredibly important because of the labor system. It was sugar that brought slavery and specifically African slavery to the New World. Sugar was one of those commodities that was produced and then sent over to the uh, old world. Uh, tobacco, like sugar, is also a, a similar what we call cash crop. It's going to be grown in the New World. Tobacco is grown more in the English colonies, um, eventually also utilizing slave labor, but sugar was, I would say, more profitable and certainly one of the first uh, things to be produced. One distinction that we can make between these two was that sugar was an old world commodity. Right, so this was grown historically in the Middle East. Tobacco, that was New World. There was no such thing as tobacco in Europe and Asia and Africa before Christopher Columbus. 
and this was grown, uh, you know, in the Americas. So a cash crop that was then exported, right, to uh, then exported to the old world to European uh, consumers. Uh, animals were very important between this breakdown of new world and old world, right? The new world didn't really have that many animals, right? It was the old world that had all the animals. And so things like horses, sheep, cows, pigs, goats, right? All of these things, all of these things, we'll go to mark this, went from this side to that side, right? That was the animals. Most of the animals, it was, it was more or less that direction. Uh, we'll go ahead and, let's, yeah, we'll just go ahead and leave it at that. Um, so animals were also very important, right? Especially the introduction of the horse into North America. Horses were then utilized, especially by the Plains Indians and became an instrumental way of life. But there were no horses in North America before Columbus. That was an important uh, aspect of this exchange. However, the most consequential of this exchange was the disease. And you see this illustration of people who have smallpox and the massive amount of dying that took place. The spread of disease not only decimated Native American populations, but completely turned their societies on their head. You know, you can think about the type of social disruption which would occur. I mean, you know, this is especially relevant today given COVID-19 and sort of the crisis that we're currently under. But, you know, these diseases, the smallpox and other diseases that spread from the old world to the new world, again, disease, let's go ahead and draw it on green, came from this side to this side, right? And it was this side of the world that really experienced the significant drop off in terms of population. Uh, oops. What am I doing here? Right, you know, it's this part of the world that experienced a huge decline in numbers of population. Uh, that paved the way for, you know, Spanish conquests and conquests from other European colonizers. It was incredibly important. In some cases, up to 90% of the people who got this disease died. It didn't hit everywhere at first. And in fact, for the next 200, 300 years, diseases will make their way through the Americas, decimating those populations. And the reason was because there was no immunities in the New World. Right, that for thousands of years, literally thousands, people in the old world lived with their pigs, lived with their goats, lived with their sheep. And they died from disease, but it was over time, right? It was over the course of thousands of years, people on this side of the world died from disease, but had built up immunity over time. Once those diseases were exposed to American populations, there was no immunity and this ravaged those populations. In some areas, in order to replenish tribes, uh, mourning wars were fought, and the idea was to kidnap, uh, in some cases, members of rival tribes, but also European individuals as well. And this was to try and solve the problem of having populations that were decimated. So. Uh, and, and the thing, and the last thing I'll say about the Columbian Exchange too is that this was, you know, practically entirely unintentional. Nobody understood what was going on with disease at the time. There was no idea about germs and germ theory and what was going on. The Spanish did not intend to spread disease to the population, but certainly reaped the benefits from it. And it was massively consequential in the next hun you know, hundreds of years as people from the old world, this time we're talking about populations, people from the old world would pour into the new, right? Absolutely pour into the new.